Matthew chapter 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. And Judas begat Perez and Zerah of Tamar, and Perez begat Ezram, and Ezram begat Aram, and Aram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Naasson, and Naasson begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz of Rechab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias, and Solomon begat Rehoboam, and Rehoboam begat Abiah, and Abiah begat Asa, and Asa begat Josaphat, and Josaphat begat Joram, and Joram begat Ozias, and Ozias begat Joatham, and Joatham begat Achaz, and Achaz begat Ezekias, and Ezekias begat Manasses, and Manasses begat Ammon, and Ammon begat Josias, and Josias begat Jeconias and his brethren, about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begat Salathiel, and Salathiel begat Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel begat Abiad, and Abiad begat Eliakim, and Eliakim begat Azor, and Azor begat Sadak, and Sadak begat Achim, and Achim begat Eliad, and Eliad begat Eleazar, and Eleazar begat Mathan, and Mathan begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are fourteen generations. And from David unto the carrying away into Babylon are fourteen generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are fourteen generations. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. I'm talking today about Blessed Mary. About Blessed Mary. In Matthew chapter 1, we begin to get, get the, the picture of Mary as, first and foremost, the, the blessed wife. In verse 16, we find Joseph as her husband. In verse 18, Mary was espoused to Joseph. In verse 19, Joseph, her husband, verse 20, we see Mary, thy wife, referred to. And in verse 24, his wife, specifically. Mary is always pictured here in the first chapter often and always as, as the wife of Joseph, as, as, and Joseph as her husband. Now, as a wife, she would eventually grow to be, though at this time she was much younger. She would grow to be that chaste keeper at home, that guide to the house. She would, she would lead about the younger women also in that same thing. She would learn to love her husband, to give proper reverence and honor and, and fear unto him. But here in the beginning of this chapter um, of Matthew, we find her at the, at the time where she is espoused unto him. Now this was just as real as a marriage. This was considered they were together. And we see that by the passage referring to, and even the angel saying, Hey, take Mary, thy wife. Verse 20, he thought on these things, and the angel said, Fear not to take thy wife. Fear not to essentially consummate the relationship. And that's what the espousal was. 
They were, they were married according to the law and according to the vows that were made, but they had not con brought, come together as man and woman. So <clears throat> he decided at this time to privily put her away. And such was the example given in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 19, where Jesus said, and As I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And so Joseph, privily, being a just man, was mindful to put her away. Why? Because she was found with child at this time. So he thought that some uncleanness had happened. And so Deuteronomy chapter 24 was going to be put into practice here. But it wasn't as he had, as he had supposed. In uh, verse um, 18 there, the Bible records, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they had come together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily, but while he thought on these things, you got to love Joseph for not being hasty in his anger, not jumping to things and just, just throwing her up. He thought long upon these things. And while he did, the Bible says, Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And so while he thought he could take Deuteronomy chapter 24 and apply because he had found some uncleanness in his newly betrothed wife, the reality was is there was no uncleanness, but rather a miracle and, and great righteousness of, of the highest and beyond compare was now within his wife. The Lord Jesus was placed there of the Holy Ghost. If you continue reading, it shows here that this was in direct fulfillment of the word of God. Verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Which, being interpreted, is God with us in direct fulfillment to the word of God that was proclaimed so long ago in the book of Isaiah God would become flesh God would be with us and the chosen vessel of which he chose to be transported in for the time after conception and up to birth was that blessed wife of Joseph Mary verse 24 says then Joseph being raised from sleep did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. She called his name Jesus. And that's an important point there, is that he knew her not until that time. He, he, he kept her as a virgin until that time. From that time in her life until a little bit beyond that, she remained this way. And so we see here Mary as that blessed wife. The next thing that we'll see is Mary as the Blessed Virgin. Go to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1, and in verse 26, the Bible begins, it says, And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And so here, she is that virgin who is espoused. We think in Western culture quite often that the, that the engagement is this process that is, is, uh, is not um, a full marriage. And then usually uh, the end of the virgin happens the same time as the marriage. But uh, the culture here is a little bit different where they'll come together and what we would call an engagement time is considered a lawful marriage with only a, a, a time of waiting up until the, uh, the marriage and the, and the consummation takes place. But here we find Mary, again, with child, which would have been shocking to Joseph, but she remains that virgin. Her name is Mary. She's espoused to a man, and yet she is that blessed virgin at this time. She's married but hasn't consummated the relationship at this time. Verse 28, the angel came in unto her and said, Hail! Thou art, thou that art highly favored, 
The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Verse 29. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what salutation, what manner of salutation that should be. Here it reveals that Mary is one that is highly favored of the Lord. Verse 28. The angel comes in and he says, Hail, thou that art highly favored. And why is she highly favored? Is it because of of her lineage? Is it because she was some special person? It's because she was overly righteous. No, the Bible just says this. Thou art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. And so this isn't some special thing reserved only for Mary. She's highly favored. Why? Because the Lord God is with her. Just as, 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 as Brother Shane talked about, if, if the Lord is with you, this isn't just some light thing. You want to be close to your Father. You want to be yoking up with your Father. And that's how you exercise yourself unto God, is just being close with God the Father. And here, the Bible reveals that Mary was highly favored, and she was with God, and God was with her at this time. She was that blessed Virgin Mary. And the Bible records here that she was blessed among Women Again, giving uh, credence to the fact that she's not above women. She's not something overly special. Because God is with her, she's blessed among women. And therefore, any woman who's in this auditorium today can be blessed in the same way as blessed Mary is. We see her as the blessed wife. We see her as the blessed virgin. Still, i got to think that there's something special and unique to her, that favor that she's been given, that she should carry the Lord. If you continue into verse 30, it says, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And I believe that that is a special favor given to her. But that doesn't mean that she's above us. Again, I think that God has a special and unique favor for each and every believer that's in this room. God's got parts of him to go around to everybody. He's got a special place for each one of us in his heart as his children. I've often wondered about people that um, have many children, what it would be like to, to have love for all of them equally. And you say, well, they got to love somebody more than the other. But if you talk to parents that have many children upon children, they get up to seven, eight, nine, ten children. They'll tell you that God somehow gives you a special love for each child. It's hard to believe, but you, you love one child with all your heart. And you think, how could I ever love another? My wife and I have talked about this when baby number two comes up. How are we ever going to love a child as much as we have loved Caleb, right? But the, but the, the, the teaching and the thing that I've heard from many that are older than me and more mature is the fact that, that God will just give this other compartment, that you can have just as full of a love for the second child and the third child and the fourth child as you did for that first. I believe God has that special favor, that special love, that special relationship available to each and every one of us, just as he had here for Mary when the angel said to her, Thou hast found favor with God. You continue on in verse 31, it says, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Verse 35, or verse 34 says, And then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And so you got to think Mary was feeling a little overwhelmed at this time. Having this revelation that, that she's going to be with child, great, that's a wonderful blessing. But God begins to unfold to her that the son that will be born of her shall be called Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. It says he'll be great. He'll be called the son of the highest. The Lord God shall give him the throne of his father David. 
He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. This was that eternal reign. This was this, that he would be the king. He would be that seed, that promised child that was born who would reign and rule forever and ever and ever. And Mary's like, how can these things be? See, I know not a man. She's, she's wondering how she's going to ever conceive this child of God. And God reveals unto her the Holy Ghost shall come upon her. And so in this way, Mary receives a special promise, a special responsibility, a special job above maybe what someone else would have experienced, but it was unique to her. And she might look at one of our lives and say, you know what? Wow, brother so-and-so, sister so had that special job, had that special opportunity that, that I didn't have. Mary had this because she had favor with God. Why? Because the Lord was with her. She was highly favored, but she remained a servant of the Most High God. The Bible says that Mary was the blessed wife. She was the blessed virgin. She's also a handmaid, and that's revealed in verse 36. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also received a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, who is called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Here she gives her proper place and, and, and shows us through the pages of the scripture that Mary isn't to be venerated. Mary isn't to be lifted up in worship. Mary isn't to be looked at as if she is, she is the mother of God and has something over him, some sort of power or authority over him. From the very words of Mary in verse 38, she says, Behold! Look upon me. I am the handmaid of the Lord. I am the servant of the Lord. I am, I am lower, much lower than him. And she says this, Be it unto me according to thy word. As the word of God goes forth, she humbles herself and submits unto what it says. Whatever the word of God says, that's what I will do. Be it unto me according to thy word. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. And yet... Scores of people the world over are lifting up Mary as if, as if she's on, on, on status or on par with God himself. But we see, and it's recorded here, that she was very humble, calling herself the handmaid, yielding unto the scriptures and to the word of God just as anybody else would. Not above it. She's not, she's not this, you know, this, this, this bossy pants who's, who's, who's lording over Jesus, as they often say. They'll say that she's the one that appeases Jesus' wrath, that he's just, he's so angry with the world that the only way that, that you can ever get grace or forgiveness from Jesus is to go to his mother Mary, who will then, you know, appease him and calm him down and say, yes, you should forgive them, my son. No, but rather Mary is under Christ, even though he'd just been conceived, even though it was just prophesied even that he would be conceived. She has placed herself as the handmaid of the Lord and the servant of the word that proceedeth out of his mouth. She's under him, though for a time the Bible records that she was given that parental authority over him. Go over to Luke chapter 2 and in verse 40. Luke chapter 2 and verse 40. They just traveled there, and they were uh, they were they were going to to perform some things down in Jerusalem. They came back. They received prophecy as the child grew. And in verse forty, it says, "And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him." Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was twelve years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph his, and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answer. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt with us? Hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold thy father, and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? 
Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And so here Jesus indicates, even at the young age of 12, that his intentions were to be over his wife, even as she had, or over his mother, even as she had submitted unto him. And at this time, Jesus snuck away as a 12-year-old boy, and he's in with the doctors and the lawyers, and he's reasoning with them, and he's giving them the great understanding of the scriptures that he has. And of, of course he did, because he's the Word of God, but some of you younger ones should look here and see the fact that because he knew the Word of God, even doctors we're hearing him and seeing him speak and the understanding and his answers that he had were causing them to just be completely astonished and amazed. And again, as a 12 year old, you can too take this word and you can put it into your heart and you can know these scriptures and these truths so that even doctors would be astonished at the answers and questions that you have and at the understanding and answers that you have. As a 12 year old boy, Jesus hung back and, and away from his parents and he was gone and missing in their lives for three days. It's almost a little bit of a picture of when, when Christ died on the cross and for three days and three nights he had left only to return alive again. You've got to think that when a child is missing for three days, you almost get to the point where you wonder if the child is not lost, is not dead, is not, is not gone forever. And so when, when they finally found him and they were astonished to find him so, his mother Mary was just just probably in pieces, just breaking down and saying, Son, why have you thus dealt with us? We, we were sorrowing. We were seeking you. We were trying to find you. And Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. When he said so, he, he firmly planted the fact in their minds that he was something greater than them. and He was going to be that king that was promised. And yet... That same king in verse 51, it says, And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So while Jesus was over his parents, he at the same time was subject unto him. And so we see then Mary as that blessed mother given the opportunity to have authority over the Lord Jesus for but a time as she as she taught him to walk as she taught him to, to pray as she taught him to, to do all of the things that a normal child would need to do how to how to eat how to use a fork who knows what sort of things she was given the opportunity to teach the Lord but now he's 12 years old and he's starting to pull away he's starting to be about his father's business and yet there still we see Mary as that blessed mother given the opportunity to mother the Lord to take care of that young child Go back again to Matthew chapter 2 and in verse 11. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 11. It says, And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And here we see... Mary, the mother with the young child, paired up together one with another, and the gifts come, these prominent men come from afar, and they bring these gifts to the Savior. Now, if, if they were to be on par, you think this would be a great opportunity for the, the, the people to bring the myrrh, the frankincense, and the gold, and to present some to Mary. But the Bible's clear that it's him who is worshipped. It's him who has presented gifts. Even though at this time he was just but a young child, maybe maybe two or three years old, based on the uh, the murderous Herod and the age group that he had defined would be destroyed as he tried to kill the Savior in verse 16. <clears throat> but Mary here is given that opportunity to be with the Lord, serve him as under her, but also take care of him, care for him as the mother over him. Here she is prominent with the Savior. She's coupled with him. She's in his company. She's ministering with him. She's also caring over him. But we see then that she wasn't worshipped. She wasn't offered the gifts in the same way. Though at this time, I think it would have been fitting to do so where she's supposed to be blessed as the mother of God, or blessed as that <coughs> perpetual Virgin Mary, as the Catholic Church teaches, but it's not so. Matthew chapter 13, 
we see her as the mother, not just of Jesus. Because in Matthew chapter 1, we saw that Joseph knew her not until, he knew her not until the days were fulfilled that Christ was born. In Matthew chapter 13, and in verse 53, it says, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence. And when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogues, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Now notice this. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. And so here, while she is the mother of Jesus, she is the mother of the Savior, the Lord, right? She does not remain so as he takes the step of authority over top for her and says, I'm about greater business than this mother. And at the time, we also see it, it played out that Mary did not remain that blessed virgin, did she? Why? Because she had James, one brother, Joseph, Simeon, Judas, and it says, and his sisters. That's upward of six siblings, at least, that Jesus would have had at this time. So Mary was a very blessed mother indeed. I'm going to go to Psalm chapter 127. Psalm 127. And she was blessed because throughout all of this, we finally and, and ultimately always see her uh, seeking the Lord. We see her um, being with the Lord. The Bible refers to them being, being, being together. Uh, the Bible says that the Lord was with her, and that's why she was blessed and favored among women. Psalm 127 says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Were, were Mary to go about and try to do things about her own and not be with the Lord, she would have labored in vain. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. So here, that psalm almost typifies Mary at this time. The Lord building up her house as, as, as was promised. She, she had that child, that, that Christ child born unto her, but that wasn't it. Afterwards, she came together with her husband and received the heritage. She received the reward. She received the full happiness that comes with having a great and full family and being the mother of so many children. Go back to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 and verse 39. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 39, we find Mary. And she arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into his city of Judah. So we see the haste and the happiness as she races to her cousin to give of the good news that she had just received. <clears throat> Verse 40 it says, And entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. A little backstory is that Elizabeth is her cousin. And so as soon as Mary had the revelation from the angel, she got up and she stormed off to meet with her cousin and to tell her of the good news. Her cousin had already heard of the good news that would come, and so she knew as she entered in what was going to happen. And when that all came to fruition, John the Baptist, who was in the, the womb of Elizabeth, leapt for joy that the Savior had just arrived and that, and that he was now in the presence of of the Lord. He was just a, a young, maybe four month old child at that time in his mother Elizabeth. And when Christ came, obviously in Mary, Mary bringing Jesus into that room, isn't it amazing that you see the power of the Holy Ghost enters into that room at the same time? Elizabeth being full of that same Holy Spirit. Verse 42 says, And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit 
of thy womb. Blessed again among women and the Lord Jesus within you, she proclaims as Mary walks in. Verse 43 says, And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come unto me? And so here we see, we see her referred to, Mary referred to as the mother of the Lord. Now this isn't the same thing as the mother of God because the Catholics teach that that's some sort of eternal state that she's always in. But the reality is, is that yes, at this time, the Lord dwelling within her, all of them receiving prophecy that it would be so. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and shall be with child. Before a virgin shall give birth and shall be with child, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. They all knew the prophecies. They all knew the preaching. They had all known what the angels had said unto them. And so she cries out, the mother of my Lord, giving, giving preeminence to Mary and rejoicing in the same. She says, for as soon, in verse 44, for lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Just another testimony of the fact that the Lord had arrived. And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Another verse that indicates that Mary isn't just some elevated thing. Why did she have a performance of those things? Why was she granted that she should carry the Lord in her, in her womb for that time and, and mother the Lord at that time? Well, because she was blessed in that she believed. Isn't it always by faith? She heard the word and she could have just said, no, I don't believe that. I, I doubt that. She could have backslid. Maybe the Lord would have to find somebody else to take that preeminent place as, as the, the one that would carry him. And yet she is blessed because she believed. And because she believed, she saw a performance of those things. Did she not? And that's revealed in verse 45. And that's the same way it works in our lives. When we believe, when we trust when we obey and act upon the things that God wants us to do, there is a performance of the promises that he made unto us. It's always the case in any Christian's life. Mary's not more important or more special in that area. Every Christian has the opportunity to grow by faith in that area. So we've seen Mary as the blessed wife, the blessed virgin, the blessed mother. Now we're going to see her as the blessed handmaid. Look at verse uh, 46. And watch her response. She, she has her cousin, as she enters in, say things to her like, you're the, you're the mother of my Lord. You, you are a blessed among women. She says, she says you're going to see a performance of those things. She, she's, she's elevating Mary. She's giving her preeminence. She's, she's saying, what a wonderfully blessed woman you are. In verse 46, and Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. She's saying, I intend to magnify the Lord God with all my soul and with all my spirit. She's, she's lifting up the Lord in this, giving Him the preeminence of all the situation that she's in right now. She's not going to take any of the credit to herself. It's a miracle of God. God deserves to be magnified as my Savior. He needs to be lifted up. And would to God my whole soul, would to God my whole spirit would celebrate in this time and would give him the proper glory. So again, we ask and we look at this, who is being magnified here? Yes, Elizabeth said some things to, to magnify uh, Mary at this time, but immediately she says, no, 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 magnify the Lord. No, 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 no. God is my Savior. My Savior is being born unto me. What a miracle that I can be a part of this. She said, would to God my whole soul and spirit would just be humble and would lift him up. Verse 48 says, For he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. You see that humility. You can almost hear it in her voice as the text comes across. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. She, she's just she's simply stating the fact that wow, that people would call me blessed. What an honor that somebody would think of me as a blessed person person because God has impacted my life in such a way among women what an honor it is to bear any child let alone the Savior let alone Jesus who shall save his people from their sins she's feeling so blessed why is she feeling so blessed because she's not esteeming herself as some great person she's esteeming herself low and so she's like why, God, should you look upon me? Why, God, would you choose me? I'm just your lowly servant. I'm your lowly handmaid. 
And so she's astonished that she can be blessed and called blessed by generations and generations and generations to come. Verse 49 says, For he that is mighty, and these are the things that I'm going to point out as to why she is blessed as a low handmaid. Verse 49 says, For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. Any one of us can be as blessed as Mary if we recognize that the Lord has done great things for us, has he not? The Lord has done wonderful and great Amen. things for us. He that is mighty, he that is great, he that is wonderful and true and just and infinitely above any one of us hath done great things for us. His name is holy. His name is not tarnished. His name is, is not held in any kind of low reputation. God is above and we are beneath. And yet, he has done great things for us. And Mary says, I am so blessed. Behold, they shall call me blessed generations to come. Why? Because God hath done great things for me. It's nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with him. We need to think about that this season. Verse 50 says, And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. Another reason why Mary was blessed and we're blessed today is that his mercy is upon us. If we fear him, we have access to the greatest gift of all. And the greatest gift we've received as salvation is that he loved us, he gave himself for us, and he offers us mercy of the same. Now she had already believed unto salvation, I, and I believe many of us, most of us in this room have already believed unto salvation. And yet if we continue to walk in that fear of God, God's mercy is given unto us. Just another reason why we are blessed. God's always giving us mercy. God's always giving us grace. And we need it because we're going to slip up today. We're going to slip up tomorrow. We're going to sin the day after. We've sinned today, even on our way to church today, right? We're, some of us are sinning in our minds right now, right? But, but the reality is, is that if we constantly are in a state of, of fear and reverence before God, the mighty one, he that is mighty, his mercy is available for generation to generation to generation. He has plenty of mercy to go around. And that's another reason why Mary was blessed and why we are blessed. I love her response here. She continues in verse 51. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of his hearts. His strength, his arm, his defense, his, his, he is the high tower for us, the shield and buckler God is to us. His strength is there, and it's available to us. He hath showed it. He has demonstrated it. Each one of us, if we thought long and hard enough, we could count our many blessings, even as I think Mary is right now. She's thinking about the fact that she is so blessed. Well, it's amazing that somebody would call me blessed, and one of those reasons is because God's strength is with me. There's times when I thought I was going to give up. There was times that I was going to quit. There was times I was going to throw in the towel, but God strengthened me. There was times when I thought I would be destroyed by the enemy. There's thought I, times that I thought I was going to be run down and defeated by the enemy, and yet God's strength was there. He came just in the nick of time in my defense. In verse 51, she's highlighting that. The fact that he showed his strength by his mighty arm. And he scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts, giving clarity of mind to the believer and strength to sustain while scattering abroad and confounding and confusing the imaginations of those that would come against them. The next is verse 52. She says, He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. God knows how to abase and how to exalt. He knows how to lift up and how to confound and put down. And who to do so with. He knows how to lift up those that are fearing him. He knows how to exalt those. And God is always seemingly doing the opposite. Those that think they're mighty, think they're strong, think that they're something special, those are the ones that God is going to abase. The proud in heart. And yet the lowly, the humble, the meek, as Mary has shown. She's elevated to the point where, think about it, people are trying to consider her a god. 
They're trying to consider her above Jesus. That's how high she's been elevated by the Lord God. And yet you constantly find her just putting herself down where she properly should be. Don't worship me. Don't, don't bow to me. Don't, don't think of me more highly than you ought to. Magnify the Lord God, my Savior, was the first statement that she said to Elizabeth when she walked into the room. And I bet you she was doing this all the time, just trying to, trying to tell people, I'm just a vessel. I'm just a handmaid. I'm just the one that carried the Lord. He is the Savior. He is the Redeemer. He is the King of kings, Lord of lords. Don't worship me. And yet she's somebody that was lifted up in God's eyes. And so people have grabbed a hold of that and tried to lift her up the same. But God knows how to abase and how to exalt and who to do so to. That's why we're blessed. Verse 53. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent away empty. The next reason why we're blessed today is he supplies our every need, doesn't he? It's not our wants, it's not our cravings, it's not our lust that God seeks to fill. But look, he takes here and takes the hungry and fills them with good things. So he does supply our need, but isn't it interesting? It's not just he takes the hungry and fills them with meat sufficient for them. No, he fills them with good things. And here in Canada, we have it pretty good, I think. We all eat well. We're not just eating roughage. We're not just eating shrubs. We're not just eating plain rice on the floor, right? We're, we've got good things. He takes those that are hungry and fills them with good things. God's showing that not only does he sustain and supply our need, he also gives us above and beyond the good things that we even would request, even even above and beyond. I think Mary's just kind of thinking to herself about the fact that, you know, even if I was a, a, a pretty good person in my Christian walk, I, I, I only deserve to be full. I only deserve to be satisfied with bread. And yet God is giving me good things that I can carry the Lord. What a blessing. What a miracle this is. He, God takes the empty and he fills them. He takes the poor and he provides for their need. He takes the sick and he gives them comfort. He's always giving good things to his people. And I love that Mary, as she was almost elevated, almost exalted by her cousin there in that situation, she takes the opportunity to say, hey, it's God that supplies our every need. It's amazing that he would give me more. Verse 54 says, He hath hope in his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. The next reason why we're blessed is that God keeps his word. And that's what Mary's saying here. She's saying, hey, God spoke to our fathers. He spoke to Abraham. He spoke to his seed forever these truths. He spoke to Isaiah and told him to prophesy what's happening to me right now, what I'm experiencing, that behold a virgin should conceive. What a God that would keep his word. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. It's just one of the many blessings that we have from the Lord. He's done great things for us. His mercy is upon us if we should fear him. His strength is available. He knows how to exalt those that are in his will. He supplies our every need and he keeps his word. Deuteronomy chapter 7, in verse 6, the Bible says, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. If anyone's exalted here, it's not just Mary singularly. It's all of God's people that are exalted. Look what the Bible says here in verse 6. For thou art a holy people. Thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people above all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And we know that that is fulfilled completely within Jesus Christ. When that promised seed came, when Jesus was born of the virgin, that seed was the promised one that was connecting back to this, that when we're united with him, when we're in Christ, when we believe on him to the saving of our soul, we enter into the covenant that he's promising to Israel right now, and that's we would be holy unto him, chosen, special, favored above all people of the earth. And yet that should humble us as it did Mary and it does every time I think about these things. Verse 7 says, The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest in number. He set his love 
upon you, not because you were the greatest of people, but because you were the least of them. He said his, he said his miracles upon you, not because you were some great thing in this world, but because you were low and meek and ready to humble yourself. When you were saved, you didn't come to the Lord, as some people will say, you know, you know, whistling Dixie with your head held high. You had to bow yourself. You had to come to the point where you said, hey, I can't get to heaven on my own. If I'm going to get there, it's not going to be by my works. I'm going to fall short of God's glory, no matter how good of a person I am. I can't do it. And so the Bible records that as he did to his people Israel, so does he to us. That he chose us because we were the least and chose to lift us up above all the people that are on the face of the earth as his chosen people, as his special people. Verse 8 says, But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen with the hand of Pharaoh, and from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Because he first loved us, he chose to elevate us. He did it by bringing us out of the strife of hell, of the, of the, of the, the condemnation of fire that was awaiting. He, he redeemed us out of the house of the bondman. He redeemed us out of this world. He chose us as his peculiar people to have a special place in his heart. And that's why we're blessed today. And this is why Mary has, has come and thought of these things and meditated upon these things. And I'm just... Pulling this out as one example from the Old Testament of God keeping his word to us. If you believed on him today, you, you have access to being brought out, being redeemed out of what you were a part of before, out of what you were in before, out of your eventual condemnation of death and hell. Verse 9 says, Know, therefore, that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. That promise just goes on and on and on. If you even think of that as 20 years a generation that would pass. This is far beyond comprehension. To us, 20,000 years is like eternity. When we think of our lives only being the span of maximum 80 to 100 and yet God promises his word will be true and his word will always stand. His oath that he swore unto our fathers, his oath that he promised unto those of old still stands today. Why? Because he is God and he is the faithful God and he is the true God. And this is just another reason why we are blessed. We find here Mary. She is that blessed wife. She is that blessed mother. She is that blessed handmaiden of the Lord at a time she was that blessed virgin was she not but it's all because of the Lord God that she is with because the Lord God that she has trusted has believed upon has put her faith in that's the only thing that separates her from just anybody else she's lifted up she's elevated hey we stand in that same position lifted up and elevated as the Bible promises chosen special above all the people of the earth that God would reach out and in his mercy choose to offer us salvation that we could just freely receive. The reason why Mary is blessed is the same reason why we stand here blessed today. Why? Because God's done great things for each and every one of us. His mercy is upon us and it continues. He saved you and he gives more mercy and grace to you every day. His strength is available to you. He will exalt you. He will supply our every needs, and God promises He will keep His word to us. As He did to Mary, so He did to us.